Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church. You might notice something a little different up here, and it's that we moved the pulpit to the side. There's been a light that's flickering, and it's been making it kind of tough to read out of the bulletin and a little distracting during the sermons. So while we wait to get that fixed, we're going to just preach from this side. Yeah, sorry if that bothers you. <laughs> it's the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, and our theme for today is followers of Christ maintain proper priorities. Priorities are a good thing, but it's not just about ranking things in order of importance. Having priorities allows you to say no to some things, too. The Bible gives us plenty of examples of setting our priorities straight, and we'll find those in our readings today and in Pastor's sermon. We begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God. Gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. 
For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us forsake all trust in earthly gain and find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman is a commander in the king of Aram's army, and he had leprosy. And so Elisha tells him to go and wash in the Jordan to be cleansed. But look at what Elisha's servant does. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept the thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never make, again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may, God, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. 
So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to, chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. And when Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes? Or olive groves and vineyards? Or flocks and herds? Or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. The word of the Lord. The choir will sing.
Our second reading comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 4. God's word is like a sword. It cuts through our pretensions and pride and exposes our true priorities. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. Judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10. Jesus helps a young man see a problem deeper than his failure to keep God's law perfectly that he prioritized his wealth above the call to follow Christ. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. When Christ is our top priority, we know that we are saved. The Reformation song we're about to sing reminds us of that.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father, through our Christ, our only Savior. Amen. The portion of the word we're looking at today is our gospel from Mark chapter 10. Friends in Christ. Today, Jesus is faced with a question, a question that haunts many people on this earth, the question of eternal life. What do we need to do? Many religions claim that they have an answer for that. Many people have been made rich by claiming that they have the answer. But we are, if we are going to find the true answer, we have to turn to Jesus, who came from heaven in order to seek and save what was lost. And he found us. We were lost, but now we are found. We have been given his righteousness. We are saved. We are safe. We are secure. And still, our human nature will sometimes ask, what must I do to be saved? In today's gospel, we see a young man, a wealthy man. He would have had all sorts of servants. He no doubt inherited a lot of money, but he didn't waste it. And he didn't spend his life in frivolous pursuits either. He was focused on what really counts in this world, the spiritual questions. And so as he comes near and sees Jesus, he gets right to the point with this teacher. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'd be surprised if this was the first time the man had asked that question. That kind of question doesn't really just come out of the blue. This man, I, I could picture him going around from one religious teacher to another, trying to get at it, get, get the truth there of the deepest questions, the deepest spiritual questions around. It's likely that at least once, the answer he got would have gone something like that, something like this, excuse me. Well, son, if you want eternal life, if you want to be on good terms with God, then do what he says. Follow his commands. Do your best to do God's will, and you'll be okay. You'll have a contented, a meaningful life, and you'll have eternal life. Well, this man apparently had tried really hard to do that, to follow God's commands. When Jesus ran through the Ten Commandments with him, saying, this is what God demands, the young man replied, maybe not very humbly, but in his mind accurately, that he had kept all of these commandments. He had never murdered anybody. He had never defrauded someone. He'd spent his time helping other people. And the guy probably was a good guy. He probably was someone who was respected and admired among the people there. But there was something that was causing him pain. If his conscience had actually been fine, he wouldn't have been coming to look for Jesus in this case. But his conscience must have been gnawing at him. He probably was hearing this refrain again and again, it's not enough. You haven't done enough. There's something still missing. And that is the real problem here. The wrong answer to this question of what we must do will leave a person empty, leave us just continuing to search with an accusing conscience. I read that years ago there was a survey of Lutherans, that is members of all different Lutheran church bodies, and three out of four said that they were trying to get to heaven by keeping God's commands, doing what God said, by being good Christians. But if we follow that approach, we'll just be stuck in despair. We won't have any real peace. We won't have any certainty of where we are headed. We'll just keep struggling and struggling and trying to make excuses for the bad things that we find that we are doing. Well, this rich young man, he heard of this teacher, Jesus from Nazareth, who performed amazing miracles and who taught with God's authority himself. He must have thought, I'll go to him. Maybe he can give me a little peace of mind. It's possible that the young man had heard what, had, what Jesus had just said right before this, as recorded in Mark chapter 10. We heard it last Sunday, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about divorce. And Jesus concluded that section by saying, you have to become like little children if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. And this man might have thought, well, I am like a little child. I'm innocent, and I'm sincerely interested in learning about God. This man wasn't like the Pharisees who had tried to trick Jesus. No, this man really wanted an answer. 
And then we read, Jesus looked at him and loved him. What a beautiful moment. This shows that Jesus loves all people, even those people that don't get it, those people that don't have the right answers to the eternal questions. And what a comfort that is for us when we sometimes are confused about those big questions in life. It should prompt us to love and to be concerned for all people out there, even those people who are sincere but they're confused about religious truth. It should encourage us to talk with them instead of condemning them. After all, Jesus is patient with us when we don't fully get it, and he is patient with all people because he wants all people to repent and to believe and be saved. There are a lot of young people, especially today, who don't know that Jesus is their savior. And they're looking for help, but they don't know where to look. So Jesus uses us to direct them to the right answer. Jesus loved this young man. So he looked him in the eye and said, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. That's quite a surprise, a surprise to us. It would have been a surprise to the people around him too because this man had just said he had kept God's commands. And they would have expected Jesus to say, good, you've kept the commands, you tried really hard, you're in. But Jesus loved the man too much to tell him that. Jesus knew that that wasn't the truth. And so Jesus gave him one more thing, if he was going to try to earn his salvation, one more thing to do. And with these words, Jesus reduced that man to nothing when he came to trying to earn his salvation. Go ahead, sell everything you have and give to the poor. He was really saying to that young man, you think you've kept God's commands since childhood, but you haven't. You are not going to gain heaven this way. This applies to each one of us. We heard it in our reading from Hebrews before. God's law judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It drives us right to the bottom line in assessing ourselves. We have to recognize that we try to get through life by thinking that we are doing well enough. Maybe we're better than other people. And Jesus pulls the rug right out from under us. We don't keep God's law totally. We don't keep it perfectly. We don't keep it well enough. The true answer is found in Jesus' final words to that man. He said, then come and follow me. To follow Jesus means that we have to understand we are no longer in charge. It's like giving up the steering wheel. We are not leading, we are following. But we are following the one who loved us enough to come from heaven in order to save us. And he loved all people in his own heart. The one who lived a perfect life or for us. That rich young man, he thought that he'd kept God's commandments but he hadn't. That was clear when Jesus told him, why don't you sell everything you have and, and follow me? And the man wouldn't do it because he loved his wealth more than he loved God. But Jesus truly kept all of God's commands. Jesus didn't love wealth. Jesus was not only willing to give up his possessions, Jesus gave up his life in order to save us. And then he rose from the dead to make it certain that we were saved. And he invites us then to follow him through this painful life, through that eternal life he has prepared for us. And by inviting us to do that, by telling us to follow him and trust in him, the Holy Spirit actually comes into our hearts and changes us so that we can do it. At the end of our gospel, the, the, the apostles there are saying, how could anyone be saved? And Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. The Apostle Paul knew this. Prior to his conversion, he had tried to keep God's law perfectly. He tried to win God over with his zealous life. He even, even persecuted those Christians when he heard about them. God struck him down, blinded him, and told him to follow. And Paul then realized all those works that he had done, they were absolutely worthless. Paul stopped being the master and instead became a follower. And what did he learn about it all? He explained it in the book of Romans. To the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, 
but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. All the work, all the good deeds that he had done hadn't win, won him anything, but trusting in Jesus gave him the righteousness that would see him all the way into heaven. To that question, what must I do? There is only one answer, trust in Jesus. Or as Jesus said here, follow me. And as we learn about Jesus' amazing works, then he changes us so that we do trust in him fully. It starts with a word that comes down from heaven. The Lord God speaks the gospel to us. We hear again about how Jesus kept the law perfectly in our place as our substitute. He did the things we could not do. And then his righteous record, that becomes our righteous record. And we see Jesus dying for our sins. And we know that the punishment we deserve has been completely abolished. It is all taken care of for Jesus has suffered in our place. We are saved. This is the good news. This is the gospel that saves us. This is the true answer. What must I do? Trust in Jesus Christ. And we are certain of our salvation. Amen. Please stand. We confess our priorities, and they are expressed uh, together, by saying, first of all, the first commandment and the meaning from the catechism. We say the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And then we confess what God has done for us with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We have a few special prayers for our prayer of the church this morning. Firstly, for Judy Rears, who will have surgery to put in a pacemaker this week. Um, we also are going to pray for the, the people down south who went through both those hurricanes. Um, pray for their recovery and that everything comes back to normal quickly. Um, and then lastly, for Bill and Helen Rose, they celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary this past week. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. 
encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Especially bless Judy Rears, who will have surgery for her, for her pacemaker. And also for the people recovering from the hurricanes that have gone through down south. Bring them back to the safety and comfort of their home as they rebuild. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Eternal God, your love endures forever. With mercy and might, you have sustained Bill and Helen with blessing upon blessing as they now give you thanks for 65 years of marriage. You have been the source of the strength they have enjoyed and the spring of the faithfulness they have shared. As they rely on you for every good thing, we ask that you continue to go with them as their God and Lord. Preserve their faith by your word. Consecrate their hearts to your service and to each other and lead them forth in your peace. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you haven't, please sign the friendship register in the back. Uh, if you're watching online, there's a link in the description and you can check in there. Uh, there's also an offering plate back there for you to leave an offering. If you wish, you can give online electronically at our website. We continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion. We practice something called closed communion. So we invite those who are members of the Wells or ELS to join us for that. And if that's not you, then we just ask that you study God's word with us so that when we do celebrate the, the Lord's Supper, we may celebrate as one body united in faith. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Please stand. <laughs> Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. congregation may be seated. Please come forward at the direction of the usher.
the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Where Your Treasure Is. Welcome again to Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Thank you, Pastor, for your message about making Jesus our priority. When Jesus is our priority, we know that we are saved and we can be confident in that fact. I have a couple announcements for you to this morning. Uh, the first one is about these beautiful altar flowers. Um, they were given in uh, honor of Bill and Helen's 65th wedding anniversary. The second one is today is the big day for Trunk or Treat. Um, thank you to everyone who signed up. Uh, it's gonna be a great event. If you didn't sign up, but you are free this afternoon, we would love to have you come join us. It's going to be a lot of fun seeing all the kids in their costumes, giving out, giving out some candy. So if you are free, I would love for you to join us. 
The last thing is, in two weeks' time, we're going to be having uh, the Joint Reformation Service. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite you to join us for that service. And secondly, there's a sign-up sheet in the back to sign up to bring meals or food for the meal that we are planning to have. I hope to see you all there, too. That's all I have for you this morning. God bless your Sunday and your week.